stand for the reading of the Word of God. For we, not just me, but we, amen, are laborers. It's not a dirty word. Together with God, you are God's husbandry. And you are God's building. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, help me to recap quick and to get into new ground, Lord. Uh, thank you for the honoring that went on this morning because what you honor, you access, Lord. So I know there's things going to be coming out today in abundance, Lord, because you will never disappoint, never. We love you and we give you glory, honor, and praise in the name of Jesus and all of God's children in the house. Say, amen. 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 Hallelujah. We went over that miracles are usually just enough, but that after the miracle, there's a mission. Yes, the Red Sea parted, but it was to get Israel out of Egypt. And yes, Jesus was raised for the dead, but that was to be able to raise up many sons unto glory. We learned that you don't need more than enough to start, but you will need more than enough to finish. We uh, went over last week that more than enough is a byproduct of just enough that's been developed or compounded over time. And that we stated that you develop daily, not in a day. Are you ready for new stuff? I'm going to... We're going to hit the tail end of last week, and we're going to just roll and flow right into some new stuff this morning. More than enough is for the intention of fulfilling your purpose, not your pleasures. See, somebody, when they finally get the faith message, a lot of times they will get it and they will start perverting it. I even had to do that myself. I can remember before I was ever baptized in the Holy Spirit, before I ever started learning kingdom principles, and I, and I saw the code that was laid out in Scripture, amen. Before that, I would give to the Lord, and I didn't know anything about sowing and reaping. I didn't you know anything about future destiny, purpose, and everything. I just gave to God because I loved God. I didn't know anything could come of it. I had no idea that what left my hand would never leave my life. And I was even taught, you know, when I was younger, that if you didn't tithe, God would take it out on you. If you ain't going to tithe him, he'll take it out on that car. You'll have to, have, you know, your car will break down. If you're going to tie that washing machine to tear up. I mean, all kinds of different stuff. Which was basically, it was people trying to manipulate other people to give. Amen? Because their motives probably wasn't pure either. Amen. Amen. And I always just gave just because I love God. And then after I received the Holy Spirit, and I realized this is a kingdom principle. This is how things work for increase in the Bible. That whatever you have, you put it into His hands and He multiplies it. It's the law of multiplication. That one seed might produce one stalk of corn. Well, that one stalk of corn might have about six or seven hundred other seeds. Well, you take that six and seven hundred seeds and plant it, and, and, and how much more are you going to have to have after that? Thousands. See, it's multiplication. And so when you get that and you start learning that, your flesh can rise up and all of a sudden you can start using God's system for your own. I am not getting any help in here today. And God had to remind me of that. So why are you still giving? Well, Lord, you know, I'm sowing for this and believing for that. Yeah. But why are you doing it again? There's nothing wrong with naming your seed. There's nothing wrong because if you have a need, sow a seed. This is kingdom principles. But you can't get it perverted. And, and do it for your own pleasures. If you want to get out of debt, have you given to anybody who's getting trying to get out of debt? See, you've got to care more about them. Do you like being in debt? No, I don't want to be in debt no more. Well, they don't either. So think of your brother first. Amen. Sow a little seed to them because you want to see them get out of debt. And what you do unto others, God will do for you, Ephesians chapter 5. Hallelujah. See, that's the purity of it. Amen. 
More than enough is purpose-driven, not pleasure-driven. God will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, pastor, yeah, but you see, you know, the Scripture does say that God will give you the desires of your heart. I'm well aware of that, and we're going to get there in just a second. He will give you the desires of heart. Listen, once you decide, once you decide <laughs> to delight yourself in Him, See, God's always got that fail-safe in there. Like I told you last week, love is the foundation of everything. Because if, it if it's not love, then there's no way that you could ever have faith for it because faith worketh through love. See, because you could have a whole bunch of self-centered people that want to use that book for their own agenda, not His agenda. That's why He puts love in there, because God is love. So faith worketh through God, you could say, because God is love. That way he, you keep it pure. You can't... You can't go and, and, and mess up. Mm. But first you've got to delight yourself in Him. And you've got to reverence Him. And walk in His ways. Psalms 37, 4. Let's go there. Don't just take part of a verse and frame a whole doctrine around it. Just like you hear, well, God will work together, all things together for good. That's not the only part of that verse. And there's a few verses before that and a few verses after that. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. It's quiet in here now, isn't yeah. it? Because my Bible reads in that section that those who love God and are called according to His purpose, yeah. all things will work together for good. Well, I love God. Oh, okay, well, let's, let's don't just throw words around. If you're going to use the Bible, then we need Bible definitions. You can't just put your own definition in there. The Lord said in, in uh, 1 John that if you love me, and matter of fact, he said in the book of John, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Amen. So if you love him, all things will work together for good. What does that mean? That means you're keeping his commandments. And that's as New Testament as it gets, y'all. Psalms 37.4. I did say 37.4, didn't I? Okay, I'm in the wrong place. I'm in 34.7. 37.4, that's why I didn't look right. All right. Delight thyself. Delight thyself. That means you giving yourself over. You're happy. Matter of fact, going literal, it means to be flexible and pliable. Let me break that down to you. That means your will is this. God wants you to do something, and you're like leaning towards a, no. You don't want to, but He wants you to. But if you delight yourself in Him, you're pliable. You'll bend. You will bend. You will yield yourself to Him. It sounds a whole lot like not my will, but thine be done. See, we don't have the weight of the world like he did on his shoulders, but we have Garden of Gethsemane moments every day in our life. Hey, yep. man, this is good, y'all. I am preaching already my face off. Amen. We're going to have these moments. And if you're delighting yourself in the Lord, that means you're bending, you're pliable, you're soft. You're delighting yourself in him. Sounds a whole lot like putting God first. I shall have no other gods before me. Amen. Love the Lord God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That's delighting yourself in the Lord. Once you do that, see, everybody wants to skip to the next part. You got to do A before... Come. Delight yourself in the Lord. Why in the world is any preacher that's actually called to God say to stay in worship and stay in the Word? Why in the world do we all say the same thing? It's because we're trying to delight ourselves in the Lord. Being pliable, putting Him first. Once you delight your... And you know what? You've got to put that flesh under. Because it don't want to. It says this uh, carnal mind is enmity towards God in, in Romans. In other words, it's hostile. It's hatred. It's an enemy against God. It says it can never be subject to God. You will never train your flesh. 
See, there's a lot of people out there that they walk, that, that there's a line out there, and they try to get as close as they can without touching it, and they think, they think that if they get that close, they won't step over it. Your flesh don't operate like that. It can never be trained. It can never be obedient. It hates the things of God. It's an enemy. It's hostile with the things of God. You've always got to keep your flesh under. Amen. You see, your spirit has been redeemed. Your mind is being redeemed. And your flesh will eventually one day be redeemed. Future tense. But you've got to deal with it right now. And you have got to, you've got to purposely, intentionally delight yourself in the Lord. Amen. When Scripture's so clear that when there's a battle coming, you send out praise first. You send Judah first. You send out praise. How many times do we send out pleading and begging before we do praising? I'm not minimizing problems and struggles or anything else. But see, we've been conditioned. We've got to recondition ourselves to what the Word says. Because if you... Oh, I am going to get so up in your business. If we really believed that, we wouldn't be half as stressed and distraught as we usually are when problems come. You're just showing yourself just what you really truly believe about your God and His Word. Yeah, but this is going on, that's going on. Yeah, it is, but God. Amen. I ain't getting no help today. But what is whatever it is compared to... Well, I'm depressed. Well, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Hallelujah. And His presence is fullness of joy. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. But see, your flesh wants to have pity parties. That does not mean that there's not concerns. The Lord told you to bring your cares and concerns to Him. But He also said... He said, cast your cares upon me. Right. See, y'all don't realize it, but when you go around and mully grub and sob and murmur and everything else, what you're doing is you're carrying your own care. You've not cast it on the Lord. You're carrying it. The very fact that you're still upset about it means you're trying to hold on to it. You're trying to work it out. You're trying to do something with it. And that's a form of pride. You were never meant to carry a care. He told you to cast your cares upon Him because He can handle it. It even says in Hebrews uh, chapter 4, it says to labor to enter into His rest. Right. See, that's what separates religion and good preaching. I could get up here and say some stuff and hoof it up and everything. You got to give it to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Stand up and turn around three times on your left foot and God going to bless you. But you got to battle that flesh that wants to cry out, and that wants to murmur, complain, and want to be in pity and everything else, that is not going to help you. That is counterproductive. Amen. You enter His gates with thanksgiving. You enter His courts with praise. You send praise out before everybody and everything. If you really believed, if you really believed this book, why would you ever be worried again? The Master said, Let not your heart be troubled. The emphasis is you. Do you really believe that? Are you going to be troubled? Yeah, but they say. Yeah, but what did God say? Think he can't handle it? You think he caught him by surprise? Oh, glory be to God. This is good preaching. Let's go to Psalms 128. Hallelujah. Psalms 128, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is everyone. Amen. See, everyone's blessed. Wait a minute, wait a minute. that's not the end, though. Once again, that's, that's, that's not the end. <laughs> blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord. Matter of fact, it goes on to say that the Bible will define itself if you, if you try to... Find it. Amen. 
It didn't define itself. It says the fear of the Lord is to shun and to hate evil. Fear of the Lord is not you're, you're scared that he's going to smack you over the head with a lightning bolt or something like that. It's reverential. It's you're in awe. He's God Almighty. And you're in awe at him. You see, yes, he is our father. Yes, he is our daddy. Yes, by the blood of Jesus, we are brought into the holy of holies. Yes, we sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Yes, we are joint heirs with Christ. Yes, that we are sons and daughters of the Most High. But how could you really see him as he is and not be in reverence? I mean, we have got angelic. We got the 24 elders around the throne, 24 cells, and just as soon as they, they bow down and just as soon as they see him again, they got to go right back down again and say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Amen. Tell me this. How many people have, how many people when you see the scripture actually see any kind of angelic beings or, or, or uh, visualizations from God? How many of them say that they feared and trembled? Right. See, there's a lot of people say, Well, I saw an angel. And they just go on just like he was, you know, just like, homie or something like that. But when I read my Bible and somebody really has an angelic experience, uh-huh. That's right. For us guys, you know, your leg might be a little wet afterwards. Amen? Amen. It's something to behold. It's something to see. Glory be to God. I know sometimes we entertain angels underwear, but that's just because they, they testing something, they doing something. But when they want to make themselves known, Hallelujah. There's something to it. I'm not saying there's fear. It's just that it's awesomeness. And what you don't understand is there's awesomeness in you more awesome than that. I don't like it when people like you, somebody passes away where they needed another angel in the choir. Why would you say that about them? That's horrible. What do you mean? What, what, what do you mean? That, that's honor. That's not an honor. It says in the book that we are sons of God. Angels are not sons. They're servants of those that will receive salvation. The Bible says that we're to judge angels. Did you know that? We're going to judge angels. So to be compared to an angel is a demotion. That's an insult. Don't say that to me. You're insulting me. I made in the image of my father. Glory be to God. Oh, we got to get back to the basics. Get a hold of this word. Our identity of who we are in him. Hallelujah. Delighting ourselves in him. Having reverential fear for him. That he's got on. Listen, and just because you say that does not mean you still can't snuggle up in daddy's lap. Amen. You, you, you're just getting one extreme on one side and one extreme over the other. Because the same Bible that says fear, fear of the Lord is also the one that says boldly come into the throne room of grace. So don't run off in one direction too much. Rightly divide the word, scriptures say. I just don't know how... This is going to be... When we see him face to face, oh, well, it says in the book, it says that when he see him, we'll be as, uh, we'll be as him. Amen. Y'all can't handle that this morning. I better move on from that one. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. That's Old Testament. New Testament says the same thing. That we be like him, that we're to be, that, uh, we're to be like him. To walk the way he walked. Amen. 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 Reverential fear to walk in his ways. See, we sometimes forget that we always talk about his birth and his death. Praise God for his birth. Born of a virgin. The, 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 the Lamb of God in his death that was slain for the foundation of the earth. Right? Well, guess what? There, in between baby Jesus and the manger... And hanging on the cross, there was a whole life he lived, y'all. Why do you think that we got insight peering into his life? Because we are to walk in all of his ways. Amen. Yeah, but he's Jesus. Why do you say the works that I do, you should do also? Mm -hmm. Why do you say that this is the victory that's overcome the world, even your faith? Once again, quoting what I said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Why let your heart be troubled? In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our what? See, it goes hand in hand. Oh, help me, Jesus. 
Verse 2, For thou shalt eat the labor of thy hands. Thou shalt eat the what? That's what we talked about, you kicking this thing off. We labor with God. He wants laborers in his field because there's a plenty harvest. He doesn't like people sitting idle. He wants them to get out. Paul was saying that he labored more than they are. Amen. Because we need to take our just enough and we need to labor and get more than enough. Take the one talent and get the two. Take the two and get the five. Take the five and get the ten. Amen. And see, it's not, it's not earning, it's learning. It's not a works mentality. It's not greed, it's growth. You're not earning anything. Well, the way you make it sound, Pastor, is no, you're not hearing me. I'm not making it sound like if you do this, it's works, and then it earns you a thing here. Everything he does is by grace. How dare anybody think they're ever good enough to receive something from God by their own merit? But you grow into it. And it's not earning, it's learning. Because once you learn more, once you have that, once you start having information and you start meditation on the information, you get revelation. And when you get that revelation, you get impregnation. And you grow. And you're ready for level two. Amen. We went over this already. What happens at level two? The same thing going to level three. You're going through the same stuff all over again, just at another level. Because it takes more than enough to finish, just enough to start. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shall thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Well, I'm not well and happy. Well, what are you doing with what he gave you? Are you working it? I think the best thing for people, look, I've said it before, people who are depressed, you have depression because you can't see your tomorrow. That's all it is. In other words, you don't have any hope. You think things are always going to be the way they are. You can't see past now. If you could ever see your tomorrow. See, that's what God put in us. That's, that's, that's hope. I don't know if you're ready for this or not. If I see you chewing real hard, I'll get off of it, okay? <laughs> if it's just too thick of a piece of meat. You see, our soul, you'll hear it, mind, will, and emotions and memories. Huh. But you see, negative thoughts, negative thoughts, is where you get stressed and depressed. Okay? That positive thoughts, listen, listen, listen. People don't do it. They think it's crazy. Listen, this wasn't started in Eastern religion. God started this. That the, How you have positive hope, how you can see your future, listen, is God gave you something, and it's called imagination. See, your memories, you can't change your memories. They are what they are. So you can go into your past and you just have to see it for what it is. Hopefully you can see where God was with you through the whole way. Amen? Through the good and the bad. He's always going to be with you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. But imagination. I can't believe I'm going in this direction. Here we go. Your imagination is positive hope. God has given you a womb to birth something in. That's your imagination. That's you seeing your tomorrow. That's calling those things that be not as though they were. That's taking this book and seeing what he says. Because faith is the evidence of things not seen in the natural, but you see it inside yourself. You have positive imagination. And if you're always living in your now or you're always living in your past, of course you're in a funk. Now, can you see what God has said for you? Can you see it? Because I'll be honest with you, I'm, we're all geared the same way. If you could at least see the finish line, you probably will finish your course. It's just that so much, we, we have something that goes on for so long, we get so conditioned to a condition that we don't think it has an expiration date. 
Why? Because, well, we've woke up, uh, you know, 2,039 days just like today. Why is today going to be any different? For the first maybe 200 days, I had high hopes. Well, what changed? Did God change? Did His Word change? Or did you change? And you start thinking about what couldn't be instead of about what could be. Because if you really knew that this thing had an end, if you really believed, if you really believed when he said we're going to the other side that you would get there, you wouldn't get in funks. Because you know something's getting ready to happen on the other side. Because he said so. And like we've been talking, well, yeah, but so much. What is time? Time is trying to grow you. It doesn't change God. God's not like, well, you know, I promised them, but, you know, I got to cook that thing up for about three years. That's hard to cook. Ain't nothing hard too hard for God. He even said that, too. He said that to Sarah back in Genesis. Anything too hard for the Lord. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We get worried, distraught, and depressed, and, and distressed because we can't see our tomorrow. Because that's what happens. When you can't see your tomorrow, you constantly live in today. And until you can break out of that, your tomorrow will be your today. Amen. Just keep chewing on it and you'll swallow it eventually. Not being satisfied is a symptom of continual growth. You ever notice that somebody that is in a funk and they just stay down and out and they're just, they've been there for years and there is no change in their life? Remember, nothing will change in your life until you do. Nothing will start working in your life until you do. And they just refuse to work on anything. They refuse to change anything. They stay in their today and their today will always be the, a today because once the, you know, once the midnight, it's, it's today again. You never really get to tomorrow if you think about it. So your tomorrow has got to start today. And have you ever noticed that anybody's in that condition that they, they, they never have a uh, not being satisfied with stuff? In other words, they get complacent and, and they just is like, well, this is it's just how it is. Well, thank God, at least I got a roof over my head. And you need to be thankful for that. Ain't nobody saying you need to be, not be thankful for grateful for what he's given you. That's not being taught out here. But those that stay stuck are those that stay. They, they, you just stay. You're not thinking of tomorrow. You're not taking the word and imagining. You're not using your spiritual womb to birth something in. You just stay where you're at. I mean, why did you think, thank you, Holy Ghost, why do you think that God said, Abraham, I need you to step out of your tent? Good God Almighty, I'm about to run. Y'all living, some of y'all just living in your tent too much. God's trying to talk to you. You can't get an understanding of what he's trying to say. So sometimes he wants you to get out of your tent because all you see is your four walls. That's all you can see. Why do you think he got him out of the tent and said, look at the stars? Because you ain't getting this, Abraham. I got to have some faith to come out of you because nothing's going to happen until you get some faith. I got to show you something. I got to get you outside of your tent. I got to let you see the vastness. In other words, quit circle in your finite brain or everything around your head and get out of your tent and look up into the heavens and see the vastness of who I am and what I can do. Amen. Trying to get it. See, God's good like that. If you just keep going with Him, even if you don't understand, oh, hallelujah, it'll come. It says, it, it says that through faith we understand. You know, of course you don't understand yet. You ain't got faith. Once you get faith, you'll understand. Once he takes you out of the tent, you get to look at the start. Oh, that's what you're talking about. Yes. Now I got a visual of it. Yes. Basically, what did he do to Abraham? He just gave him the spiritual room. Yes. He just gave him a place to grow something in. Yes. Oh, yeah. See, because when I was in that tent, I didn't see how that would be possible. Because I'm limited in my tent. It's a pretty good sized tent, but... I mean, it's still got limitations. But I can step outside of that tent and I can see where God lives. I'm not bound. I'm not bound out here. I can think that now. Glory be to God. Hallelujah to His name. Because not being satisfied is a symptom of continual growth. 
Once you get out of that tent, you look up to the stars, and then you go back to your normal every day, you're like, nah, this ain't competing with what I saw last night. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. It's like somebody giving you an all-access pass to Disney World, Universal Studios, and uh, what's that other place that's there? Epcot Center. Epcot Center. They give you a pass, and you get, the, you get to go to the first, first in line pass, and they give you a three-day pass, and you do that, and then somebody decides that they're going to send you to a small country fair. <laughs> it just don't excite you quite like it did out down there in Orlando, would it? Amen. Amen. And see, that's, that's healthy. Because what happens, you've been going, used to going to little country fairs, and you think the little swirly twirl is awesome. You think the darts hit the balloons. I mean, ain't nothing like that. And then all of a sudden, you step into Epcot Center or Universal Studios, and you realize, oh, whoa, you're getting exposed to something. But if you always stay stuck and small, you'll never be exposed to big. Amen. And you, it starts right here. It's a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If you're always thinking small, you'll always do small and you'll always be small. But God came that you would have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. For His purpose and pleasure. He said He created all things for His purpose and pleasure. Your gifts, talents, skills, and everything is for the kingdom, to grow the kingdom. And they don't want you in this small little area. I can remember when I first... Yeah, I might as well just start here. How much time do I got? I ain't got Kimberly in here. I need to wind it down. I'm not even going to get halfway into what I was talking about. <laughs> Glory be to God. <laughs> Miss Kimberly's usually up here with the clock to let me know when I'm, my time's ticking on. I'm... I'm encroaching on that right now. But see, I'd always, when I got saved, it was you know, in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, and there's nothing but small churches everywhere. I mean, if you go into a 200-seat a church, they would consider that big. <laughs> and so usually you have you know, churches that will hold you know, 50 to 100 people or something like that, and they're, they're everywhere, and praise God for them. I'm not condemning them. Amen. Don't get out of here saying I'm condemning those little country churches. I saved in a little country church. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But that's all I ever knew. And then I come down here to Mobile. And then I had the opportunity, because I was just so curious about it. What's that over there? Oh, that's a church. That's a church? It looks more like a fort. Well, yeah, it's a church. You sure it ain't a coliseum? No, that's a church that's been there for a long time. So I step in the dolphin way for the first time. And I'm like, Lord Jesus. I mean, I'm, my mind is being blown. But listen, I'm growing at the same time. You mean you can really do this? God, God really thinks this is okay? I mean, this is not being like carnal or, 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 or just being selfish or, or th this, is, this, is, this is okay? And I expanded and grew. And then it come to me. Listen, look, once again, I'm not condemning small churches and everything else. Amen? Well, we're a growing church. Last year we took care of a family for Christmas. But you see, when I see the vastness and I see the growth and, and I see everything for God's glory and splendor, see, I just don't think about materialistic things and being the talk of the town. When I see this, you know what comes with that? We, we don't just feed one family for Christmas no more. We could feed a hundred. We don't just have one or two service teams out in the community. Now we have enough people, we got a hundred teams out. Well, y'all sound like you're just going to come in and take over. Yep. Yep. Ain't no bones about it. It's going to be a colony of the kingdom. We're going to take it over. Hallelujah. We'll build when we can build. We'll buy when we can buy. We're going to come and we're going to take over. This will be a colony of the kingdom. It's always been my day anyway. Anyways, why shouldn't it be years down the road? Why can't we have the absolute 100% nicest playground for kids in the, in the whole state? 
So everybody want to bring their kids on our property. Why? Because we got the bomb. You, can, you ain't no playground like that. Now we'll have rules and regulations. Amen. No fussing, cussing, smoking, drinking, or chewing. Other than that, come on in. Amen. For the community. I can see is I can see maybe this building one day will be turned into a vocational center or something. Because of the stuff that I've been talking about right now, nobody ever told them that they have gifts, skills, and talents. So you can bring the carpenters in here. You can bring the plumbers in here. You can bring the electricians in here. And you can give them through a certified course where they can get a certification to be able to take a test, to get a license, to be able to go and have a job. Pastor Kimberly would love to have a ladies' transitional home. Be selective. Not everybody, but those that have showed progress and they've showed that they're really wanting to do this. They don't want handouts. They just need to help up. They've already put through the time and energy. They have a job. Come on in. Real cheap rent, but you only got like six months or so, amen, or something like that. In other words, this ought to be an incubation time to get yourself together enough mentally, physically, and financially to be able at the end of six months seven months, whatever it's going to be. I don't know. I'm just throwing out stuff. That could change drastically. I don't, I don't know. I'm just, just speaking out of my heart. But after this time period, you should have saved enough and everything done enough that you now you're prepared to be on your own. Because you need to be on your own. Hallelujah. You see what I'm talking about? So when I see growth, it's not greed. It's growth. Why in the world would you not want to do more if you could? How selfish to say, oh, just us and our four and no more. Why not do more? Why not make an impact? I heard of a church before we started this church. It was a church outside of Atlanta. And they built it and they stayed there. And it uh, got built up. It was a very large church. And then the pastor said, even heathens in that community. Listen, even heathens. People who don't love God. They don't care about coming to church. They're going to watch pornography and just sip, you know, sip on wild turkey and smoke reefer and all that other stuff. They could care less about God. That they would even stay even said, man, if that church shut down, I don't know what we would do. When you have that kind of an impact in your community, you know you're doing something right. Because I guarantee you, everywhere that Paul and Peter and all of them went, you didn't forget about it. Wherever they went, they, they, they took the anointing of the Holy Ghost, the mandate of God, go ye. Hallelujah. And that's what we're going to do here. That's what we're going to do here. I said I was going to close. Let me finish. Can I at least finish this sentence? I'll leave the next paragraph off for next week, but let me finish the sentence. <laughs> Not being satisfied, listen, is a symptom of continual growth and divine Frustration, listen, divine frustration is God's way of leading you on. So many people are in a funk and they think, well, the devil's attacking me. The devil's attacking me. What if I told you that it's not the devil, that there's a divine frustration going on? God is forcing you to a place where all you can depend on is him. And he's been trying to tell you for the last five years, go ye therefore in this direction. Because he knows that when you go in that direction, everything that you need is already there waiting on you. But you won't get up, move, or do nothing. And so he's going to put a divine frustration to force you to move you out of where you're at. Just like the mama eagle, as soon as that eagle gets a certain age, she takes all the fluffy, feel-good feathers out of the nest. So all it has now is just some thorns and briars and some sticky points. And it's not nearly as comfortable and cushy. And then if it still don't act like it wants to do nothing, it'll pick it up. Throw it out of the nest. And so not everything in your life is an attack of the enemy. Some of it is a divine frustration. And I've been sitting here as an enforcer of God to kick you out of your comfort zone. 
Because we believe what we said. It was a mandate for God to activate the purpose and potential planted in every person. You can't do what you want that God wants with for your life if it just stays dormant. Somebody got to agitate water and activate that seed that God planted inside of you. You got to get moving. You'll never reach your destination. Look, God cannot steer a parked car. If you've just got your life in neutral or your life in park, you're going nowhere. If you get on, well, I don't know what to do. I hear that. Well, I don't know why God will do. Do something. Because even if you're on the ro wrong road, if you're still traveling, God can do a U-turn. He can't do nothing for your life if you're stayed parked in the driveway. So quit begging, screaming, pleading, crying, and everything else. You've got to get on the move. And then God will lead God and direct you once you get on the move. He's, he's the best GPS system. He's, he's it. He knows the end from the beginning. But you've got to get on the move. You've got to be exposed. Does the music play? Somebody play the music. So it'll remind me I got to quit. Before I get crunked up again, I might say something that gets me happy and I'll go for another 10 minutes. You have got to get out of your tent. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. You've got to see the sky and see the vastness, the, the limitlessness of God and delight in Him and see your tomorrow. Reverent Him. Be in His presence so you can hear what He's trying to say. I don't know about you, but I can hear Pastor Kimberly a whole lot easier when she's talking right in my ear sweet, sweet words than I can if she was halfway across the campus. So if I want to hear what she's got to say, what do I do? I get in her presence. Hallelujah. So as we leave today, God wants us to have more than enough. And when we delight ourselves in Him, and reverence Him. He does give us the desires of the heart. Because now we're conformed. We're being conformed into the image of the Son of God. Our motives are pure. Our objective. In other words, what used to... I can just tell you right now. If I could talk to me 20 years ago. And I could go back in time and 20 years ago and say, Alright, what would make you happy? What would you like to see? I guarantee you it would be totally different than what... You know. See, remember, a man of faith trusts God. But a faithful man God trusts. God couldn't give me keys to the kingdom back there. What a mess I would make of it. How I would have used it for my own good and pleasure and purpose. But see, now my desires are different than they used to be. Hallelujah. See, back then, I would want to be in front of a bunch of people just because I want everybody to tell me how good I am at playing that guitar. Feed me, feed me, because I never heard it from my dad growing up. Hello? Hello? So somebody got to feed me. Somebody got to tell me I'm great. Because why? Because there is greatness in me. Everybody saw the king, but they, everybody saw the kid, but they couldn't, couldn't see the king. Because there's a king in every kid. And in, even if it's not in your own father's house, ask David. Jesse never saw the king. He just saw the kid. And so he had to send a prophet. And that's why things changed in my life. Because see, now I don't want a whole big group of people just so somebody can say, you preach good. I already know I can, amen. And that's not being boastful or prideful. That's because I know that he called me and he always equips the call. It's not my anointing, it's his. Right. If you say anything against that, then you're saying something against God. I didn't call me, I didn't anoint me. That's not my word. And, he, and, 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 and what's going through, uh, the anointing's coming through me is not because I thought of something really good. I'm not that smart, y'all. Amen. But see, now it's different. Now I want to see a whole big group of people. Why? Because of the testimonies that went out earlier. Because your life's going to be changed. Your life's going to be changed. Your life's going to be changed. You and you. You're finally going to figure out your purpose and call. You're going to realize there's greatness in you. You're going to come out from under that. You're going to become over that. Oh, yes. You're going to find a place to operate in your grace. You're going to be able to function in your unction. And then after it starts, then I see the community start changing. And by the time I go home to be with the Lord, I can step back and say, I've run my race and finished my course because 
property value at the, the, in this area neighborhood was you can buy houses for fifty nine or sixty nine thousand dollars, but after forty or fifty years of ministry, bringing the kingdom in, the blessing in, having this place developed, and now you got gated communities. You see people's lives transformed. Poverty kicked out of this area. That principality got to go down. You see religion booted out. People know who they are in Christ. Right. And you see walls of racism tear it down. Well, it ain't a black church. It ain't a white church. It's not a Hispanic church. It's not an Asian church. It's the church. Hallelujah. Then all the newscasters wondered how in the world in lower Alabama, Alabama? How can so much diversity and so much love, how could you get so many people in one place with one mind because we have one God. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah.